So I know it's bad form to start off a talk with a caveat, but like five minutes before I got up here, my allergies started to kick in. So if you hear dramatic pauses, that's not a dramatic pause. It's just me <laughs> catching my breath. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is August, and I'm a designer, and um, I work at Xbox, as David said, uh, at Microsoft. I'm not going to be talking about Xbox today. I'm definitely not tweeting about Xbox today. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about something completely different. So about two weeks ago, uh, David contacted me and said, hey, you want to talk about the future? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to share uh, with you today is kind of a work in progress. It's actually, um, I just happened to have been working on a lecture about the future. Uh, so I'm trying out new material. Um, I understand part of this is also to spark conversation. Uh, which the last 20 minutes of this, uh, I hope, will be. So um, at Microsoft, uh, they like to put employees, especially ones in managerial positions, through all sorts of psychometric evaluations and tests. So um, I'll, I'll get a little intimate here and share with you my Myers-Briggs score. Uh, um, I guess the one-line uh, motto for this uh, score is my management style is, um, I'm sorry, but you must die. <laughs> Um, <laughs> on a, some scale where they assign you a color, um, I actually hit red twice, so I'm both red social, and in some completely other scale, I'm a red reformer, but I've never been called a social reformer. <laughs> um, and then my favorite one, and this is, the, this is why I'm bringing all of this up, is there's something called the Strengths Finder, and it tells you what your top five strengths are, and my very top one is something called futuristic. And here's a little excerpt in uh, the style of um, horoscopes and fortune cookies that uh, the future fascinates you, <laughs> uh, as if it were projected on the wall. Uh, you see in detail what the future might hold, uh, a better product, a better team, a better life, or a better world. Uh, it'll always be inspirational to you. So um, that, po that raised a question in my mind. Why am I so obsessed with the future? So I went through this kind of Japanese uh, quality control management technique called the seven whys, where it's like this causality statement after causality statement. So why do I like the future? And kind of drilling down to the seventh why um, is a little bit surprising. Uh, I discovered that um, it's all rooted in this kind of childhood fear. Uh, and in fact, um, I'd argue that it's one of the reasons that swayed me to enter the design field, um, particularly uh, design and technology. Um, when I was in elementary school, my best friend uh, was this guy named Drew. Uh, and in the fourth grade, uh, we started doing sleepovers about once, once a month at each other's houses. And I always looked forward to going to his house because uh, his mom would always make the same meal uh, with her homemade spaghetti sauce. My mom never made spaghetti. Uh, and then she uh, concocted this thing called monkey bread. I don't know if uh, it's kind of like a cinnamon roll, but it's not a spiral. It's, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, according to the routine, uh, we would watch movies. And this is totally dating myself, but I thought Drew's movie watching habits were especially cool because he had both beta and VHS. <laughs> and then, after his parents went to bed, uh, uh, we'd sneak back downstairs and watch movies uh, we weren't supposed to watch. The horror movies were eight years old. Uh, um, so, and again, I was dating myself. Alien and um, Friday the 13th, the first one, uh, and The Shining. That really screwed me up, too. <laughs> and uh, by the way, uh, Drew is now um, a well-known movie critic in Los Angeles. Um, so the thing is, uh, that was kind of like the bad influence, though. And so I found myself, even at home, not sleep overnights, uh, often sneaking downstairs late at night to watch movies um, uh, that I was either under uh, the age restriction for or whatever. It was like long before parental controls on cable boxes. And so um, I ended up, one night I ended up watching this movie called uh, The Man Who Saw Tomorrow. It was like this pseudo documentary with uh, Orson Welles and it was about Nostradamus. Uh, and um, I have to admit, 
This was like a confession. It was terrifying. <laughs> it was really terrifying. And if you don't know who Nostradamus was, uh, it's um, this guy from the Dark Ages who encoded all these predictions about the future. And according to the documentary, it was shockingly accurate. And he had these visions of wars and genocide and the extension of humanity. And this is pretty heavy stuff for an eight-year-old. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that morning, um, I, I'd argue that I was transform transformed. This is like, now that I'm thinking back about it, this is like one of the milestones in my life. And I remember that morning really well because I was super depressed. I was dealing with all, you know, the, 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 the weight of the world. And, uh, and I was also, um, I guess the way I characterize it, I was engulfed in the sense of helplessness. And um, mom noticed. <laughs> <laughs> And then so uh, she said something that actually helped me uh, deal with it, but it, I didn't like snap out of it right away. Uh, and in fact, uh, what she told me um, uh, helped over the following weeks and months and years. Um, but from that point, uh, I was obsessed with the future. Um, I went to the library, and this was before the web, looked up stuff on futurology and clairvoyance and science fiction, anything dealing uh, with the future. And you could argue that there's this kind of pseudo-psychological rationale about why I went to de into design, because de design is kind of like divining the future. It's anticipating uh, an outcome. And uh, if you want to get super fancy, um, it's kind of like reverse archaeology, right? Um, and I'd argue that uh, the goal of technology is also about mastering one's destiny as well. Um, it, 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 like vegetarianism, it's like asserting certain control. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is the future, but not in the sense of um, a certain control, but the future is a way of thinking. Uh, and maybe this might be a useful design tool, um, especially if you work in technology. And um, this brings me back to uh, 2009, July 10th. And this is especially accurate because uh, it's on my uh, Facebook timeline. Uh, I received a flurry of messages that um, part of my 15 minutes has been uh, spent being cited uh, in Wikipedia for having coined natural user interface. Totally false. I didn't coin the term at all. Um, but uh, according to the article, uh, a talk that I'd given back in 2008 uh, when I was working for um, m the Surface Group, not the tablet that everyone sees today, but the big table, um, I'd given a talk uh, in Sydney, Australia called Predicting the Past. Um, and it was a framework to think about new ways of interacting uh, with technology uh, beyond keyboards and mice. Uh, this, this was a multi-touch table. Um, and so this is a chart, and I've, I've seen various uh, versions of this floating around the web now. Uh, but basically, the idea was we could think about the next inflection points of interacting with technology based on previous inflection points. And it seems kind of logical. CLI's command line interface, which is a text-based thing, and then graphical user interface. And then there's this new thing. Um, and uh, detractors would say, but it's, it's totally different. And the point is, the qualities of each of the, these systems don't really matter. Uh, what matters is the differences between the systems. And so the big idea for today is when thinking about the future, it's not so much uh, the actual uh, um, artifacts, the actual things, but it's about the relationship uh, between them. So it's uh, the differences uh, that are the same. All right, so um, the title of this, call, uh, uh, this talk is uh, The Future of the Future of Design. And before we talk about that, let me talk about the future of design. And before I talk about that, let me just talk about the future. So uh, <laughs> let me start off with a pretty simple question. What is time, right? So uh, um, I, I'll, I'll simplify it. There are basically, in the, the history of uh, humanity, there are basically three ways of thinking about time. Uh, the first is chaotic, the second is cyclical, uh, and the third is linear. So the chaotic view suggests that, uh, and this is in primitive cultures, that there's no path, that it's just event after event after event, uh, and it's beyond any sort of control. All right, the cyclical view of time um, 
comes from ancient and still exists in more traditional cultures today. And uh, it's based on planetary events like seasons and the days and months, um, and also human activity, like when we wake up, when we go to sleep, when we eat, and so forth. Um, and the, the big concept around this is that time is endless and it's just constantly renewed. And the side effect of that um, is that it introduces a moral dimension into how we think about time. In other words, uh, our point of reference is comparing ourselves uh, to our ancestors. Because if all of these cycles happen over and over again, we're just the uh, uh, same script, different cast. Um, and then finally, this third view of time, which is really linear, uh, is predominantly an American uh, point of view. Uh, and what it suggests is that uh, there's an absolute beginning and an absolute end of time. And I'd argue that technology promotes this kind of linearism. And the reason why is because um, it defeats all sorts of these natural cycles. Artificial light defeats the sleep-wake cycle. Climate control defeats seasons. Refrigeration defeats agricultural cycles. Uh, medicine is the rest and recovery cycle. Uh, and even design, uh, design technology defeats this kind of creation reflection sort of thing. And there's also this kind of uh, shift in the numerical paradigm in which we think about time as well. Uh, in, in the cyclical model, uh, number four is an important number. And I'd argue it's, uh, in, in the literature, it says it's this kind of feminine quality. Uh, basically, there are things like four seasons and four directions and four elements. And the fourth element always loops or connects back to the first. Uh, but in this linear point of view, uh, it's three. And it's always, uh, it has these masculine traits in terms of triads and trinities. And the difference is that the third element transcends the other two or dominates the other two. And it's therefore directional. So in this kind of linear thinking about time, uh, we always see a, a version of a chart like this, where we just hit up the wall. It's, it's like we're on this perpetual, uh, 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 um, What's, the, what's that event where you're skiing down a ramp and then you fly out, so you're like crouching for all this time, suddenly you launch. Uh, well, for, for today, I'd like to revisit uh, the cyclical model. Um, not too long ago, I was having dinner with um, my friend Lyle, uh, and he was telling me about um, this book called The Fourth Turning, and it's an extrapolation of the Strauss-Howe uh, generational theory, which I'm gonna try and unpack for you today. Uh, um, and it has to do with Anglo-American history, um, and uh, it discusses different cycles. This is like the super, super simplified five-minute version of it. Um, so uh, let me start with lifetimes. So let's just assume a lifetime is about 80 years, uh, and there are four 20-year chunks in a lifetime. Childhood, young adulthood, midlife, and elderhood. Okay. All right, uh, now generations. I'd argue that people born in these kind of 20-year uh, chunks also follow, uh, fall into generations. And the four predominant generations right now are baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, or Gen Y, and the homeland generation. All right, so here's the new hotness. Um, there's this term called a seculum. Uh, and it looks like siècle in French. It's basically a century, but it's, uh, um, it's about an 80 to 100 year uh, long period. And it's um, about the common experiences and the common societal shifts that about four generations experience uh, at the same time. And the seculum is also divided into 20-year uh, uh, buckets. Um, and here they are. Uh, the first is the high bucket, where uh, it's an upbeat era, um, and there's strengthening institutions and weakening individualism, and there's a new civic order, uh, and old values begin to decay. So in the 19th century, uh, it was Reconstruction after the Civil War, uh, the Gilded Age, and post-World War II. This is often followed by an awakening, and it's a passionate era of spiritual upheaval, and uh, civic order is under attack, much like the 60s, uh, um, and there's a kind of new values uh, regime. So the consciousness revolution of the 60s and 70s, and the transcendentalists from the previous century are examples. And then there's an unraveling era, uh, which is kind of a downcast era. This is the one we're in right now. Uh, where there's strengthening individualism, weakening institutions, all this sounds familiar, right? Uh, old civic orders are decaying, and um, the last time we experienced this was World War I, Prohibition, and we're in the thick of it right now. 
And then uh, the, the thing we have to look forward to is the crisis era. <laughs> so uh, it just kind of cycles, <laughs> cycles through this. Uh, all right, so um, when you create your little chart, uh, um, Different generations experience these shifts at different life stages. So the baby boomers um, were born in a high period. They go through the awakening. There's this unraveling. And they'll live out their final days during crisis mode, right? So, uh, and then those of us who are Gen X, uh, the second column. Those of who are, us who are Gen Y or millennials, the third column. Uh, and um, artists, the homelanders. Uh, so we'll come back to this. All right, so that's the future. Now I'm talking about the future of design. So if you're designing stuff for the next 15 years, uh, if uh, you're Gen X, um, here's kind of the shorthand. Latchkey kid, value independence. It's about protecting yourself. It's about protecting your independence. And so the way this, this manifests itself in uh, um, uh, technology is wearables. Your cyborg is kind of like social armor. Um, and the typical, the archetypal Gen X company is Google. And what are they doing? They're making glasses. Uh, glasses, and then we also, there's like the Nike thing and sensors and so forth. But if you're a millennial and you're Gen Y, uh, according to these cycles, you're civic-minded. Um, and it's all about community. So it's not about adorning yourself, but it's about improving the space and improving sociality uh, and it's the values of connection and sharing and the archetypal Gen Y company uh, is Facebook. Um, but you'll notice that there's this kind of burgeoning growth in technologies around sensors, the Nest thermostat, smart light bulbs. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not about the self, but it's about the space in which we socialize. All right, so then what? Well, so um, that's kind of like the nutshell of the future of design. So we're getting to the future of the future of design. And this is where crisis comes back in. <laughs> so um, just like clockwork, a major, major crisis happens in each seculum. Uh, in the 15th century, there was the War of the Roses. In the 16th, the Spanish Armada was giving Elizabeth I a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, in the 17th, it was the Glorious Revolution. In the 18th, the American Revolution. In the 19th, the Civil War. And in the last century, the Great Depression, World War II. So what are we heading towards? I argue that um, now that we're in this unraveling period, we're seeing all sorts of, of these kind of end game scenarios, whether it's about uh, the um, economy, about social stratification, about cultural decay, about scary, scary technological things, scary, scary uh, ecological things, politics and the military. Okay. So let me go back to the morning after I watched that really scary movie when I was eight years old, um, where I was depressed and engulfed with helplessness um, and kind of feeling transformed, much like us as a generation uh, are at that point. Well, this is what my mom said to me. She said, there's no perfect time, uh, there never has been, and every person in every society will experience difficult times. Uh, the important thing to remember, though, uh, is what you will do uh, during those difficult times uh, and what role you will play. So in this creative morning, uh, before we return to our lives and occupations, and we're peering just briefly into the future and this kind of inevitable crisis that's about to come. We just spend a fleeting moment and ask ourselves, uh, what will you do? And what role will you play? So um, I was going to end it there, uh, but I thought that was a bit of a downer. <laughs> Not a great way to start the weekend. Well, the thing is, so the thing that I need to raise too um, is that this isn't a given. Uh, it's 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 kind of a crapshoot. It's a apocalypse or glory, because um, the thing is, every crisis is a crucible. Um, it's a kind of vessel for broad sweeping change, um, and also determinism is a total cop out. Because uh, mom was totally right. If we think about the crisis in the 20th century, uh, Great Depression and World War II, 
um, that uh, as a people and as generations, uh, we're pretty resilient as Americans. Um, there was civic resolve and social fortitude, vision and perseverance. And this is what ushered in the next cycle of America as a superpower. So um, Franklin Roosevelt uh, in 1936, uh, during his renomination uh, speech, um, said something, and again, this was in the depths of that crisis. Um, he said that uh, there's a mysterious cycle uh, in human events uh, to generations, to some generations much is given, and to other generations uh, much is expected. Um, but this generation, and I'd argue, this generation uh, has a rendezvous uh, with destiny. So uh, when we think about the future, it's really all up to us. Uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you. <laughs>
ideas beyond like critical ideas of the discussion, like the role play, right? Do you still have that? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. If you asked me when I was eight, I could list, list them all out for you. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know now. Um, yes? Um, I haven't seen the movie that you attribute to your awakening when you were eight years old. Would you recommend that we go back and watch it? No, it's, it, it's really cheesy. It's, uh, in fact, don't watch it because it'll make me even more embarrassed for <laughs> Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't don't bother. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, in the cyclical view of time, do you think Microsoft is in crisis, or is it about to anticipate? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here representing Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> the, all, all this is just just me. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So, um, if you recall the whole Gen Y column, and it's about creating spaces for sociality. And I think that uh, when, when we're talking about uh, um, the effect that technology has uh, on defeating these sort of natural cycles, I think it has that same effect on uh, social uh, cycles as well. Um, the, even even like this laptop where I put the screen up, I'm literally putting a physical barrier uh, between uh, me and you. Um, and I, I, I think the, the potential for technology is kind of like the whole apocalypse or glory uh, thing as well. But um, kind of like that stick being a chew toy or um, a chopstick or a drumstick. Technology is technology. Um, and it's really uh, what we do with it and um, the service that we put uh, to humanity uh, with it that counts. So um, with, my, with, with what I do with Xbox, for example, uh, it's a really um, interesting uh, design problem because when someone plops down in their living room and they want to be entertained or distracted, uh, the last thing we want to do is make them work for it. Uh, and so um, I think uh, really what we're creating is one of those spaces uh, that we were talking about. It's, it's, it's like um, uh, an oasis uh, from the pressures of uh, modern life, uh, that we create this kind of little sanctum uh, where someone can relax. And given these kind of uh, um, walls of acceleration for technology and change and news and data, uh, and all the other end games that are going on. Um, finding these kind of oases or um, generating them is one of the best things that I think technologists can do uh, right now. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh well, I, I think the beauty of this model is uh, most of it is already it's happened over and over and over again. In fact, our great great grandparents fall into the same category. Uh, that we do, regardless of which generation we are. So I'm Gen X. My great-great-grandfather was part of the lost generation uh, in the 19th century. Um, uh, anyone who's a millennial now uh, is in a similar um, uh, generation as the GI generation, the ones before the baby boomers uh, who fought the war. Um, and the thing is, uh, we have more to do well, actually, we have less to do with the generation that shaped us than the generation that's shaped them. So it's this kind of leapfrog. Uh, um, so Homelander's uh, 
have much more to do with Gen X people. Like we're, we're, we have much more kinship and similarity. Uh, in the same way uh, that um, like millennials have with uh, baby boomers. It's, it's, it's a fascinating subject. <laughs> All right, one more question. Yes. Um, do you see uh, you know, the advancement, our advancements in technology affecting how bad the crisis um, period is? Like, you know, because of washing machines, because of medicine, because of agricultural changes, you know, a lot of these problems that you know, were really significant in these past crises, like we're better capable of handling them? Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, again, that I think um, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff that could be learned um, <clears throat> before uh, this kind of linear view of time. And in fact, if you look at how quickly uh, the cyclical view of time got adopted uh, versus the linear one. It took centuries and centuries for uh, this kind of linear view to sink in. Um, and so uh, what, it, what it does is um, it actually builds upon itself and it defeats these sort of natural uh, progressions. So um, I think yes. And then uh, I, I think there's, in kind of uh, um, extrapolating that out, I think that there's a fourth view of time uh, the, that is still forming, uh, but I, I'd argue is a little more terrifying uh, <laughs> than the linear view, um, and I think it's brewing in China. Well, when is it? Oh, that'll be for the next talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I have time for one more, I lied. I hope, yes. Oh, well, um, it's, so, uh, it's the same way with um, the previous century and the one before that when uh, Reconstruction happened after uh, uh, the Civil War and then we ushered in the American Gilded Age. Um, and the same thing uh, um, uh, in the 20th century. Uh, the, it, generational, uh, generational qualities, uh, um, I don't think uh, they're the silver bullet. Uh, I think uh, any um, adjacent generations uh, uh, work together to create the same thing. So um, yeah, I think it, it, it all just matters about the values of the society in which uh, the genera uh, generations operate. So yeah, this talk uh, primarily focused on the Anglo-American um, uh, uh, cycles, uh, but I think it might be different uh, in other societies. All right, thank you very much.